Hi everybody, Dr. Kat Fleece here from Central New Mexico Community College. We're going to finish up the skeletal system here by discussing the joints. I only have two videos on the joints, so this is a pretty brief topic. Before we classify the joints, let's make sure that we understand that joints can also be called articulations. If you think of that layer that covers, that, that hyaline layer, hyaline cartilage layer that covers the ends of long bones uh, that is called articular cartilage, remember? So that implies that this layer of cartilage forms a joint with another bone. And so the definition of a joint is that it's a site where two or more bones meet. And notice that it says meet. So we're not saying that it's a site where two or more bones uh, can move. A joint most often will allow movement, but not always, as we'll see momentarily. Now, based on that definition, based on the fact that a joint is a site where two or more bones meet, it makes sense that this is the weakest part of our skeleton, correct? Um, if you think about that, there's literally a break in the skeleton where we're interconnecting bones, and so that makes it much more weaker, or much weaker. Now, it's kind of obvious what joints do for us. Uh, most of our joints are allowing for movability of our skeleton, so they give our skeleton mobility, and of course they allow for our skeleton's bones to interconnect. So here we go. We can now take a look at how joints are classified. And we can take a look at their anatomy, and if we do, then we call the classification system the structural classification system. If we focus more on their function, we call them or we call it the functional classification system. And this is what we're going to start out with first. For the functional classification system, it's good to ask the following question. And that is, how much movement does the joint allow? Ignore that scribble there. So how much movement does the joint allow? That's going to help you come up with these three subclasses in the functional classification system. We have the synarthroses, so plural, it would be with ES at the end, amphiarthroses and diarthroses. Syn, remember, think of the term synapsis, refers to together, and arthra, you probably already understand the term arthritis, inflammation of joints. So the root art, or even in this case, as you see, arthra, all of these refer to joints. So synarthrosis means joints together, and therefore these are immovable joints. When we take a look in an example, then we see that the seams here in our skull are examples of immovable joints, better referred to as synarthroses. And then we have the freely movable joints that we call diarthroses, for instance, if we look at our hip joint, here we see the head of the femur that fits nicely into that socket of our hip bone. That's a freely movable joint, and most of our joints are freely movable. You know, when you're moving your head and you're moving your wrists and your fingers and your legs and your arms and your trunk, all of those joints are going to be diarthrotic joints. So notice that we can use uh, an adjective form of all of these words as well. So we can talk about diarthrotic joints rather than calling them diarthroses. So that leaves us with the one here in the middle, amphiarthroses, and there you see the prefix amphi. Think of an amphibian, like a frog, uh, a salamander. Those animals, those amphibians, they can live both in the water or on land. So, you know, shall I live, shall I hang out in the water, shall I hang out on land uh, right now? So they're sort of in between. Same with, um, in between, I should say, land mammals and um, aquatic animals. And so we, we can use the prefix amphiarthrosis here in a similar fashion in that amphiarthroses are not completely mobile, but they're not totally immobile either. So they're sort of in between. So that's your functional classification. Remember what the question is that you ask? You ask yourself how much movement is allowed. Um, 
and that allows that that then leads to the functional classification as in how functional are these joints to move our skeleton you can think of it that way now before we move on to the structural classification system let's continue classifying further the diarthrotic joints because some of these diarthrotic joints are pretty limited in what plane or planes they can allow for movement. So if you go into, if you put yourself into your anatomical position and allow and grab one hand onto your other arm's elbow, you'll feel that in that anatomical position, the only thing you can do is flex at the elbow and extend. You can't move that forearm sideways at all. So there's motion in only a single plane. And so we refer to that joint as uniaxial. Your knuckle joints, on the other hand, they allow for movement in only two planes. And so we refer to them as biaxial. Many of our joints, on the other hand, are multiaxial, particularly when we take a look at the ball and socket joints that are typical of our shoulder and hip joints. I'd like for you to know these examples I've listed here for uniaxial, biaxial, and multiaxial um, diarthroses. So that brings us to the structural classification of joints. And again, we have three subclasses. And the subclasses kind of give you information on what they're all about. We have fibrous structural joints, cartilaginous structural joints, and then synovial structural joints. The questions that we're going to ask this time are, is a joint cavity present or not? And we refer to that sometimes as a synovial cavity. And we'll learn on pictures in a little bit what that looks like, this synovial cavity. And the only one that has a synovial cavity out of these three classes or subclasses is the synovial joints. How difficult is that, right? So the synovial joints are the only ones that have a synovial cavity or a joint cavity. So the other question that we can ask ourselves to differentiate between the other two subclasses is to ask ourselves what tissue interconnects the bones. So what tissue interconnects the bones of the joints? And therefore, it's pretty clear that we refer to those joints that have lots of fibers interconnecting them, uh, the bones, I should say, we call them fibrous joints. So there we're going to see primarily uh, dense regular connective tissue interconnecting the bones. Well, if we see the bones being interconnected by some kind of cartilage, then we call them cartilaginous. Let's get started with the fibrous joints. Remember, the bones of fibrous joints are interconnected by dense regular connective tissue. So there's quite, quite a bit of co collagen fibers present. And the length of the collagen fibers in this dense regular connective tissue interconnecting the bones kind of dictates uh, what subclass or sub-subclass, if we want to say it that way, um, of structural, uh, fiber structural joints uh, the, bone, the joints belong to. So we have a group called the sutures, we have a group called the syndesmoses, which is plural, singular, it would be with an I, and then the gumphoses. We're going to take a look at these to better understand whether they um, are synarthrotic or even amphiarthrotic. We're not going to see that any of these are diarthrotic, only synovial joints. Only if a joint cavity is present can joints be freely movable and therefore diarthrotic. So here we see images of our three types of joints. And the A, the B, and C letters refer to image A, image B, and image C. So our first, ex our first group of fibrous joints are the sutures, which are the seams that we see especially in between our skull bones. These are very, very, very short collagen fibers that interconnect our skull bones. And in a skull that's finished growing, 
um, that dense fibrous connective tissue, that dense regular connective tissue has become infiltrated with, with hydroxyapatites so that it has become ossified, so it's hardened. We'll take a look at a fetal skull in just a minute that hasn't gone through that process yet. Ask yourself, are sutures uh, synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, or diarthrotic? Not diarthrotic, we don't have a synovial cavity, so they're absolutely not movable at all, um, really, because of the very short fibers interconnecting the bones, so these are synarthrotic. If we now look at the synesmosis, or an example of a synesmosis, then we're looking at longer fibers in the dense regular connective tissue interconnecting the bones. So right here, let me use a color here to better illustrate that. Um, I'll just use yellow here. So these are collagen fibers that are part of our dense regular connective tissue interconnecting our two forearm bones, our ulna and our radius. And remember that the radius is always going to sit on the thumb side. Right, so this is the thumb side. Anything with the term radius in it, uh, any kind of a radial muscle, a radial nerve, a radial artery, it doesn't matter, it's always going to sit on the thumb side. That means lateral, right? Think of your anatomical position. On the other hand, the ulna is always going to sit on the pinky side, which means medial. Again, this is a nice review of your anatomical terminology. So that membrane of dense regular connective tissue that interconnects these two long bones, that, that interconnects the diaphyses of the two long bones, we refer to as an interosseous membrane. And by now you should be able to translate this as in between bones. We have something like this. We have an interosseous membrane interconnecting your leg bones as well, your tibia and your fibula. And so these allow for some movement, maybe not as much in our legs, I have to admit, maybe in our legs we should refer to this particular, to that particular synesmosis as synarthrotic, but in our forearms, when you go into anatomical position, you can actually rotate your hand and your forearm, bone, forearm bones change position as well. Notice that your radius crosses over the ulna. So when you go from the supinated state, which is your anatomical position, to the pronated state, where you now show the back of your palm to the outside world, um, you're actually allowing for that radius to cross over the ulna. So there's a little bit of movement there, and so we can theref therefore refer to this interosseous membrane at, between the ulna and the radius as being amphiarthrotic. The last fibrous joint we need to take a look at is kind of an unusual one, it's called a gomphosis, for pl singular, plural would be gomphosis, and it always applies to our teeth. So we can consider our teeth to be part of our skeleton, they're made up of pretty much the same material, and our teeth also have to be anchored onto our maxillary, uh, maxillary bones or our mandible. So, you know, we have lots of fibers here, short collagen fibers, that grab onto the bone, bony material in an attempt to hold our tooth in its socket. And so we refer to that as a gomphosis. So we've just finished studying the three types of fibrous joints, that is the sutures, the syndesmoses, and then finally the gomphoses. Now before we move on to those cartilaginous joints, as promised, I'd like to talk a little bit about the fetal skull, or we could even argue here that it's a newborn skull. You know, the skulls of, a, of our babies, any, basically the skulls of any young mammal, look very different from a fully grown mammal. For one, our, our heads always look out of proportion. They look much bigger than the rest of our body. We don't have much of a neck. Um, and we all think that's very cute, of course. But through time, those skull bones widen and lengthen, etc., and ultimately they all start to fuse together and allow for our brain to fit better, our growing brain to fit better. But so in a, in a newborn baby, we have these so-called soft spots. We're all familiar with those soft spots. And if you place your finger gently on these soft spots, we're most familiar with this top one here called the anterior fontanelle. 
then we can actually feel at times the baby's heart pulsate through or at that anterior fontanelle. It feels kind of like a little fountain pulsating, which is where the word fontanelle comes from. You might see this spelled without the L-E at the end. Sometimes it's just spelled as fontanelle the way you hear it. And there are several fontanelles. You can see them illustrated here. What's important, what I need for you to get out of this presentation is not so much the names of all of these fontanelles. If you're in, la in, in lab, you will have to know them. What I need for you to understand and remember is that, remember, these are sutures. The, the, the joints that interconnect our bones are sutures. And what are sutures made up of again? Sutures are made up of dense regular connective tissue, right? So all of these fontanelles are dense regular connective tissue, just like we see in a in an other uh, fully grown skull. What's the difference between a fetal skull or a newborn skull and a fully grown skull is that they, the fontanelles are not ossified yet. So no ossification, no minerals have deposited in them yet. And so they feel soft. We tend to think that fontanelles are made up of cartilage and that is not correct. So get that out of your head. Sometimes we believe all these things that we're told and they're not always correct, especially not in anatomy and physiology. Okay, so that brings us to our cartilaginous joints. Clearly these are joints that are made up of bones that are interconnected by a type of cartilage. And the two types of cartilages that we're seeing are going to be hyaline cartilage and fibrocartilage. We still do not have a joint cavity, again implying that either there's absolutely no movement possible or somewhat uh, of a movement possible. So they're either going to be synarthrotic or amphiarthrotic joints. So we only have two small groups. We have the synchondroses, literally meaning together cart with cartilage, and then the symphyses, together with growths, P-H-Y-S usually means growth, so I, I, it doesn't translate too well. You're, you've, you've come across the symphyses when you studied the different locations for fibrocartilage. Uh, you learned about the pubic symphysis, for instance. The intervertebral discs are also made up of fibrocartilage and help form a joint between two consecutive vertebrae and in this way form a symphysis. So you're kind of familiar with symphyses already. And in the vertebrae and in the pubic symphysis, these pieces of cartilage, of course, allow a little bit of movement, not a whole lot. The synchondroses are a little, are quite rare or much rarer than any of the other joints. So we have um, two bones interconnected by means of hyaline cartilage now. Now we look at the epiphyseal plate as an example of a temporary synchondrosis. And then try to memorize that the joint between the first rib and the sternum, and only the first rib and the sternum, is an example of a synchondrosis that is synarthrotic. So here we're looking at a diagram just as a quick review. Remember we can consider the epiphyseal plate, which is made up of hyaline cartilage, a temporary joint that interconnects the epiphysis of a long bone with, with its diaphysis. And of course, once we finish growing and that epiphyseal plate is replaced with an epiphyseal line, we can't say anymore that there is a synchondrosis present in our long bones. So this is only present in growing children, the synchondroses. Here we see an example of a symphysis, which is the piece of fibrocartilage that interconnects our pelvic bones. And I, I do want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit more about our pelvic bones because they're, um, I'll de delineate them here. So very quickly here, this is one pelvic bone, right? Oops, sorry about that which is characterized here with an opening, well, not an opening, I meant to say a cavity, right? This is where the head of our um, femur fits in. So this is the femur to form what we call our hip joint. So when a person has a hip joint replacement, what happens is that this right here, the head, 
of the femur is replaced, usually, or part of it is replaced. Okay, now the other thing to mention, and I'm going to use the other side of my diagram here, is that our hip bone, our pelvic bone, is actually made up of three fused bones, and they all meet um, at the level of this cavity right here. Right. So I'm going to give you an approximate merging point for these, these uh, different bones. So the majority of this bone, this pelvic bone, is called the ilium. So this big flaring bone is called the ilium, spelled with uh, two I's. That's important because if you spell it with an E after the L, it's a part of the small intestine, believe it or not. The part that we sit on, so kind of this portion here, more or less. You know, when you sit on a chair and you put your fingers under your buttocks, what you feel, that hard part uh, of bone, is this right here. And so that belongs to the ischium, or the ischial bone. Sometimes yoga instructors talk about their, our sits bones, the bones that we sit on. And then finally, um, I'll use a different color, this bone here, I may have drawn it a bit too far up here, but close enough, that is our pubic bone or the pubis. And from there that we refer to this right here as the pubic symphysis, right? I'll abbreviate that there. And as I mentioned earlier, the other example of a symphysis occurs in between our vertebrae. So if I make just a quick silly sketch here. Let's say that this rectangle represents a vertebra and this rectangle represents a vertebra. Each vertebra will still be covered with some hyaline cartilage first to smoothen um, the ends of our vertebrae. But then there's a nice piece of padding, and this little intervertebral disc and that makes our, our spine a little bit more flexible um, to the point that we can refer to the symphyses here formed by the intervertebral discs as amphiarthrotic, right? 